Matthew 21, I really feel I have something I want to give you today, and I want to start in verse 1. The Bible says it like this, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, listen to this part, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Could we do that right now? Could we shout that in this place today? Thousands of years later, we still shout it out. Come on, let's do it together. Hosanna to the son of David. That was, that was not strong. Let's do that again. Are you ready? Hosanna to the son of David. There we go. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One more time, say it with me. Hosanna in the highest. Praise Jesus. The title of our message today is Honor the King. You can take your seat where you are today. And here we are beginning Passion Week, or some may call it Holy Week. What does that look like? Many years ago, we're still celebrating it today. I want to give you a breakdown of what the week looks like. Sunday, what we celebrate right now is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Monday, we find Jesus cleansing the temple. Tuesday, we find controversies with the Jewish leaders. Wednesday seems to be a day of rest. Thursday is preparation for Passover Friday is trial and crucifixion. Saturday, Jesus rests in the tomb. And Sunday, Jesus raises from the dead. What a week we get to celebrate. You know, I was talking with the pastor about this week and just about how great God moves when we celebrate this week. It's like it happened so many years ago, but we remember it, we celebrate it, and we witness for it, and we, we, we continue to honor this week. And God just shows up in great ways when we do that. And I know this week he's going to do that in our lives, and it all starts here this morning as we celebrate Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time where Jesus and the disciples go to Jerusalem in the season of Passover, a Jewish tradition, remembering what God had done for the Israelites in Exodus, sparing the firstborn in every household from the threat of Pharaoh. During this week, many biblical prophecies are fulfilled. This week begins the final week. This day begins the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. The King of Kings, Jesus enters Jerusalem knowing he will be welcomed, he will be tried, and he will be crucified. Jesus was in a final triumph over disease, depression, death, and darkness. Someone praise God for that. that we triumph over disease, depression, death, and darkness. Through Jesus, we triumph. So Jesus enters into Jerusalem, and the Bible says a large crowd is gathered there waiting for him, cutting down palm branches and taking their cloaks and laying them across the road, waving these palms in the air. And the Bible says that Jesus begins to enter on a donkey and he crosses over through all these people celebrating him, waving palms in the air, representing goodness and victory and symbolic for the final victory he would soon fulfill over death. 
What were they doing? They were giving Jesus royal treatment. What were they doing? They were honoring Jesus as a king. This was the first time ever that Israel welcomed Jesus as a king and savior, not just as a prophet, as they cried out, Hosanna. The shouts of Hosanna, with the, actually the Hebrew meaning of the word means save, rescue, and savior. And in faith, the people trusted Jesus on Palm Sunday that he was going to save their life. They didn't know how, but yet they trusted him. They honored him when things were good, but the challenge was they were unable to honor him when things went bad. They honor God when everything is good and they say he's going to redeem us and bring his army. He's going to set us free. He's going to take the throne. He's going to establish our earthly kingdom. We know how to honor God when he does things the way we like him to do them. We know how to honor God when he's working in the way we thought he would work. But do we still honor God when he works in a way we weren't expecting him to work? See, these people were able to honor him when they thought he was going to establish an earthly kingdom, but he was establishing a heavenly kingdom. And the time had not come yet for that. Believe me, the time will come for that. But right now was not the time for that. And the people who were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, they had a different shout come out of them when Jesus was being tried and crucified. They had the ability to honor God in the good, but they lacked the ability to honor God in the bad. Today, I really feel led to speak to you on the topic of honor. Somebody say honor. honor. It's a very important principle in the kingdom of God. In the New Testament, the word honor comes from the Greek word time. Can you say time? time. Which means to give value, to appreciate, and to show respect and dignity. To honor someone is to esteem and treat another with respect. Somebody say respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Stick with me, all right. Honor is to esteem and treat someone with respect because of who they are and what they have done. Honor has a sense of value, of price, and quality. This is what the people were doing in that time, honoring Jesus. But what's interesting about that is the pinnacle of honor Jesus stands at as he enters into Jerusalem. He's at the highest level of honor right here. I mean, he's at the pinnacle of honor. Treat, treat it as a king. Honor is given to kings. And Jesus gets honor of a king. But what's interesting about that is Jesus didn't start off with that honor. Honor's a big deal in the Bible days. Honor's a big deal in ancient Near Eastern days. It's a big factor of life. Everything is built on honor and shame when you're talking about the days where Jesus walked the earth. He was born in a manger. He was born in a humble place. He came from a humble family. His father was a carpenter. He was at the lowest level of honor. Yet God... Through, through Jesus began to establish honor and 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 honor until he reaches this pinnacle of being treated like a king. Throughout the journey, not many people honored him, but there were a few people who did and their lives were forever changed. You find that all throughout the word, Jesus became a man. He rose from a shameful status to an honorable status. And many times throughout his life, Jesus was confronted with dishonor. In his own hometown, they failed to honor him and robbed themselves of the blessing he had stowed up for their lives. Look what it says in Mark 1. It says, Jesus went from there and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished. Not in a good way astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed him? Isn't this just a carpenter? My God. 
Imagine that, listening to Jesus preach, and you, the people just have nothing but negativity and doubt and questioning credibility and questioning who he is and discounting his, his, his status and discounting his honor. That's the kind of audience Jesus had to preach to. What's interesting is it's in his home, own hometown that he's treated like this. They say, this guy's just a carpenter, a son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Are not his sisters here with us? They were offended at him. But the Bible says, Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor. What does he mean by that? A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. He says, except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Was he lacking honor from the people? Now he could, listen to this part. This is, this is amazing. He could do no mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people. Just a few. And healed them. And marveled because of their unbelief. These people failed to honor and recognize Jesus for who he is and who he was and they not only had unbelief, but they had a lack of honor towards Jesus' life and his ministry. The Bible says because of this lack of honor, the people of Nazareth showed towards Jesus that he could not do many great works there. I don't want to be in a place where there's limitations on the mighty works of God. The Bible says this was the place that the people were in because they failed to honor and recognize Jesus. And it was the honor that was going to release the power and the blessings of God into their life. So because of their lack of honor, they shut the door on miracles taking place in their life. Throughout Jesus' journey, he was not only dishonored. The Bible says he was also honored that when he was born, people brought gifts to Jesus. Why? Is because they knew he was a king and it's disrespectful to enter into the king's presence without a gift in your hand. So they wanted to honor Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew 8, verse 8 and 10, the Roman centurion honored Jesus and said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. What was he saying to Jesus? I can't honor you in the way you deserve to be honored in my house right now. But Jesus told him, I have found such, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel, and he healed his servant. Though he was on a high level, this Roman centurion, he had a humble attitude and gave honor to Jesus and received the miracle in return. What do we see? There's people who honor God and there's people who don't honor God. And there's a big price to pay when you lack honor to God in your life. There's a big miracle you could miss out on. There's big moments you could miss out on if you don't have a posture of honor activated in your life, in your home, in your ministry, in your vocabulary, in the person you are, in the being you are. Do you have honor for God? These people couldn't honor God. They, they couldn't recognize him for who he was, so they locked the door on God and the miracles he was going to do in their life. He wanted to do mighty works. He wanted to do many miracles. But because they lacked honor, he did a few miracles, healed a few people. But where God was honored, he did great things. You need to catch this right now. Where God is honored, he moves in the miraculous. When there's a people who know how to honor God, God says, I'm going to step into that house. I'm going to step into that area. I'm going to step into that relationship. I'm going to step into that conversation because I found someone who honors me. You question why the miracles of God take place in all kinds of other countries around the world and the miraculous takes place. But in America, it seems like there's a drought of miracles because we live in a culture and a society that has shifted and went from being an honorable people to a dishonorable people. And because we have a dishonorable society and we have a dishonorable people, it locks the door on the miraculous and it locks the door on the miracles. But if God could find a people in Hollywood who honor God, 
If God could find men and women who honor God, if God could hear conversations and hear people who talk honorable about God, if God could find a family that honors God, if God could find a marriage that honors God, if God could find a business that honors God, if God could find a ministry that honors God, that's where God says, I am going to step into that place and do something great. I'm going to do something mighty because there's a people who know how to honor me. Anybody in this place like to honor me? honor God. Anybody in this place live to honor God. Anybody in this place say, it doesn't matter what society says. It doesn't matter what the news says. It doesn't matter how the music sounds. It doesn't matter what the pictures portray. It doesn't matter what society says. I live to honor God, and I'm going to honor him with all that I have, all that I am. My family's going to honor him, and he's going to move. I need someone to give God praise right now. We're going to honor God in this place. Doesn't matter what society says, does, or believes, the Bible says we honor God. And when we honor God, the miraculous takes place. God is all about honor. It's his honor, it's his system, his honor, it's his way, it's his being, it's his doing. And it expects, he expects us to be the same as him. Look at the Ten Commandments. He gave this to his people that they would go through pagan lands, be around pagan people. But they would live honorable because of who he said they are and what he wants them to do and how he wants them to be. Doesn't matter where they went. They went through all kinds of pagan places. But because God wanted honor out of them, he gave them those ten commandments that they could live honorable no matter where they go, who they were around, what society was doing. They lived honorable unto God. Those commandments are pretty interesting because the first four, they're called the vertical commandment. They're vertical. We honor God in the first four commandments. The last six are horizontal commandments where he talks about honoring people. See, honorable people don't just honor vertically. They also honor horizontally. Honor is a principle that must be activated in us. And it's a, it's a challenge I put before you this morning that you would take hold of what I'm talking about today and live honorable unto God and be honorable unto the people of God and be honorable to those you surround yourself with in society. I'm going to be honest with you today. I feel as though the school system failed me. They taught me how to put my hand on my heart, look at a flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance. But they didn't teach me how to honor. They teach you how to stand during the national anthem, but they fail to really teach honor. They teach you how to stand when a judge enters a courtroom. Anybody still stand? <laughs> you have to stand in there. You're going to leave that place. Anybody got court coming up? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you said, you got my paperwork. <laughs> They teach you how to stand, but they fail to teach you how to honor. Honorable honor is more than standing. It is also a part of that, though. Why do you think we stand when we read the word? Because we want to honor the word of God. Why do we stand when men of greatness walk into the room? Because we want to show honor to men of greatness. I don't just want to stand when men of greatness walk into the room. I want to stand when women of greatness walk into the room, too. I do my best when my wife walks into a room, I'm going to stand up when she walks into a room. I don't want her to feel like there's a level of honor that I show to other men that I won't show to my own wife. You ain't talking to me right now. So if you ever see me in a meeting, stand up. You know why? It's because I want to honor her life. I want to honor her. I don't want her to feel as though there's different levels of honor that I have for a man that I don't have for my own queen. Because I want to honor her life. I want to honor her for who she is in my life. We stand up in the presence of greatness. We stand up when we worship. Why? Because we want to honor God. We stand up when we pray. We want to, sometimes we kneel too, but we show honor to God. Anybody still stand up when greatness walks into the room? I hope we still have that in this generation. I hope we still have that in this place. The Bible says these people were throwing palms and waving them in the air because they wanted to honor God. But the scripture I feel is very relevant to them that I give to you is Matthew 15, 8. The Bible says these people honor me with their lips, 
but their hearts are far from me. Honor is not just about lip service as much as it is about life service. Honor is not just displayed by what you say, it's displayed by how you live. And there's some people that have it twisted. They think honor is just what comes out of your lips. No, it's what comes out of your life. There's some people that have said, oh, they don't show honor because of words that were spoken. And I said, no, you shouldn't look for honor by what comes out of a microphone. You should look for honor by what comes out of a life. You should look for honor by what comes out of my life, what comes out of the ministry, what comes out of our productivity, what we do with what we have. We show honor in those areas. Honor is not just about lip service as much as it is about life service. God wants to make you honorable in this place. Can you clap your hands if you agree with me this morning? The Bible says in 1 Samuel 2.30 that God says, those who honor, I will honor. When you sow honor, you reap honor. And it's very easy to honor someone who's honorable, but it's very difficult to honor someone who's dishonorable. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me, let me bring it back. We'll get there in a minute. When we honor, we sow honor, we reap honor. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 41, Jesus says, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Did you know you could see, receive a prophet's reward without being a prophet? You could receive a blessing in an area that you're not necessarily in, but because you honor the person in that area and in that office, you could be blessed by that person. On the flip side as well, if you disrespect people in an area that they're called to and gifted in, you miss out on the blessing that God put in them for you. I've been there before. I've been there before where I've crossed over the line of not respecting someone in an office that God put in position to change my life. And what did I do? I locked the door for the blessing of God that he put inside of them to change my life. But I made a decision. I'm not going to live like that no more. If someone has a gifting that may not be my gifting, I may not fully understand it. I may not fully get it. I'm going to honor it. I'm going to honor that God is using them. I'm going to honor the gift that they have. And when I could honor the gift that they have, guess what? I could receive from the anointing that they carry. I could receive from the edification that they bring to my life. I could take hold of the blessing that God put inside of them because I'm not living dishonorable anymore. But I'm honoring the gift that God puts inside of people that are destined to edify and change my life. You could receive a prophet's reward if you learn how to honor the prophet, but you can miss out on the reward if you disrespect those and dishonor people who got assigned to your life. Challenging thing about this is that God shows up and wants to use people in earthly vessels. We know how to honor God, but do you know how to honor earthly vessels? God shows up. He doesn't show up looking like God. He shows up looking like people. And the people he wants to use in your life, you need to learn to honor them. Wave your hand if you agree with me today that you're going to honor the people God places in your life. I hope we're doing something. We're working right now. See, when we dishonor, what we do is we, we move away from what we dishonor. But we bring close to those things to our life, the things we honor. The things we dishonor, we push away from us. The things we honor, we bring towards us. What you dishonor, you push away. What you honor, you bring close. Be careful that you're not dishonoring the things God wants you to honor and you don't miss out on the miracle he wants to bring through your life. We need to be people of honor. Could you clap your hands if you agree with me this morning? We're going to live as honorable people. We honor God. We honor the people of God, and we honor ourselves in the aspect of giving God glory when we honor ourselves. I want to tell you, don't ever discount yourself and sell yourself for cheap. Don't disrespect your own self. You want to give God glory from your life, so don't discount yourself based on other people's ability, disability to see your worth. There were people who will not be able to see your worth, and that's why we need to cling to the word of God and the presence of God where we find out where our value lies is not in what people says about us, but it's in who God says we are and what he says about us. That is where we find our value is in the word of God and the presence of God. So people may not see it, people may not get it, but I don't go on clearance with my life. 
Don't discount yourself on someone else's ability, disability to see your worth. That's been a prerequisite in my life in leadership and in relationships that I want to live honorable and I want to find someone that knows how to honor me for who I am, a son of God. And I want to honor the woman God places in my life as she deserves to be honored as a daughter of God. And if I'm not ready to treat her like royalty, I'm not ready to court her. You're missing it right now. I need to honor her as the daughter of a king, and I need to have a woman that could honor me as the son of a king because the Bible says we are royal priesthood. And I'm going to tell you something is that things that are valuable, people don't take test runs out on them. I never seen nobody test drive a Lamborghini. I never seen nobody test drive a Rolls Royce. I never seen nobody test drive a Bugatti. You know why? Because they're valuable. And the people who approach those valuable things, they're ready to buy that thing. Someone is trying to cross over boundaries in your life. You need to send them away and say, you're not ready for this. Let me just say it one more time. You're not ready for this. You're not ready to step into this because I am not cheap. I'm honorable unto God, and with my life, I'm going to honor God. So if you're not ready to honor God with me, there's the door. You could walk out the door. I'm going to wait on God that he's going to give me somebody who's going to honor me. We're going to honor God together. We're going to lift his name and praise his name and live a life that gives him glory. I'm just going to leave that right there. The more you learn to honor, the more dishonorable people leave your life. The more you dishonor yourself, the more dishonorable people enter your life. Our circle is determined by our level of honor. The Bible says what we reap, we will sow. If we sow honor, we're going to reap honor. Somebody say honor in this place. It even says in the Bible, in one of the commandments, is that if we honor our parents, we'll live a long life. I feel as though dishonorable people don't live long lives. Honorable people do. The jails are full of dishonorable people. Graveyards are full of dishonorable people who died at an age that should not have died at and made a permanent decision on a temporary emotion and because they fail to honor their parents and listen to counsel in their life they have to live with their decisions I hold on to this promise that says in Exodus 20 13 honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord God is giving you how many of you want long life how many of you want to live a long life? How many of you want to see your children live? How many of you want to see your grandchildren live? How many of you want to see your great-grandchildren great live? And say, look at the lineage and legacy that God has given unto me because we learned how to honor. We could see a long life ahead of us because of the honor that we possess and the honor that we carry. Even if you can't honor the person, honor the position. Because... Even for myself, it was difficult to honor some people in my, in my life. And it was difficult for me because we're living two different total lives. But even though it was hard to honor them, I still honored the position that they had in my life. Even if it was hard for me to honor the person, I could honor the position. You only get one father. You only get one mother. And we need to honor them for who they are and the role that they have in our life. And the Bible says if we could do that, God will give us long life. Somebody give God praise like you're ready to honor in this place. The honor we display is the honor that the next generation builds upon. Our children and disciples follow after. Our sons and daughters replicate and expect honor. The Bible says we are to honor God. It says in Revelations 5.12, he is worthy to receive honor and glory and praise. We honor God in what we say, what we do, and also in what we give. I like to say it like this. We honor God with our time. Somebody say time. Say it stronger, time. We honor God with our time. 
How much of your week have you been giving to God? They made me do this a long time ago. I had to evaluate my whole week. Count how many hours I slept, how many days I studied, how much time I'm on social media. Talk to me. I'll tell on myself I'm on social media too, all right? We're in this together. Calculate your week and ask yourself how much time goes to God. How many hours do you give to God in prayer? How many hours do you give to God in his word? How many hours do you give to God serving? How many hours do you give to God in church? I guarantee you if you realigned your priorities and you reschedule your week, your life will look a lot different. Because you honor God with your time. We also honor God with our talent. Somebody say talent. The gift we have, the skills we have, we honor God with those gifts and skills. We honor God with our treasure. Can you say treasure? treasure? Our wealth. We honor God with that. When it comes time for giving, it's a time to honor God. We should be excited about it. We should be ready for it. Don't enter the presence of a king empty-handed. I try to live that principle. Someone taught it to me, and I try to walk like that. Every time there's a basket going around, I'm going to put something in it. Every time there's an opportunity to give, I'm going to come ready to give. Because I want to honor God with my life. We honor God with our treasure. We also honor God with our temple, with our bodies, with our lives. I hit that earlier. I'm not going to labor that. But I just want to say this is that people of honor know how to reverence God. We have a reverence for God. You ever hear someone say, hey, reverence? That means you're being not reverent. <laughs> Like when we're going to pray, we're going to start praying. You're ready to pray and someone's still talking and having a loud time with themselves. You say, hey, brother, reverence. <laughs> that means that a person hasn't learned to reverence God yet. That's why when we're right here in the sanctuary, we want to have reverence for God. We want to sit through a whole message without looking on our phone. You know what's crazy? How long you could watch a Marvel movie without touching your phone. But you can't even listen to 30 minutes of a message without sending texts, checking your feed, going on your Instagram, going on your Facebook. Some of you, you just go through photos because your stuff is dry right now. We, have, we want to have a reverence for God. And we wonder why we don't change in a sanctuary. We wonder why we walk out of a service with the same way we walked into a service. We wonder why we're not changing in our mentality. We're not growing as a leader. It's because when it comes time where God is moving, we lack a reverence towards the presence and the power of God. So we leave this place the way we came. But there's a few people who say, no, when I get into the presence of God, I'm going to reverence God. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to listen. I'm going to take hold of it. I'm going to really get into this place. And I'm going to carry a posture like God is on the platform. I'm going to carry a posture like the word of God is being spoken. I'm going to live my life like I'm in the presence of Jesus. And when someone walks in like that, they leave different than the way that they came. Many of us, it's a reverence problem. We need to shift inside of us and get to a posture where we reverence God. Have a reverence for his presence. Have a reverence for his word. Have a reverence for prayer. Have a reverence for worship. Have a reverence wherever God is. We want to have reverence for his name. I need someone to agree with me today that you're going to reverence the presence of God. I remember hearing preachings of Pastor Sonny when he would start preaching and he'd say, you know what? No movement in the sanctuary. The Holy Spirit is moving. He reverenced God. He taught his people how to reverence God. I want you to stand all over this place. The Bible says to honor, honor God, honor our spouse, honor our parents, honor our elders, rulers, church leaders, others who serve Christ, Sabbath, marriage. God desires us to be people of honor. The Bible says these people brought branches. They brought clothing. They recognized the king is on his way. And they wanted to honor the king for who he is and what he was going to do for them. They honored the king. They honored God. They reverenced his name. Palm Sunday represents us, to us, that our God is a promise-keeping God and he's a prophecy-completing God. Just as Jesus was king, he remains king today and he does so for all of eternity. 
We are his people. We're to bow down, worship God, and honor God. I have this scripture. I want you to write it down. 1 Peter 2.17, the Bible says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Today's a day where we want to honor God. This week is going to be a week where we honor God. This is a week where we say, God, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor the price you paid for my life, the price you paid for my loved ones, the price you paid for those that are lost. I'm going to honor your life with all that I am and all that I have. Maybe you didn't come into this place with branches. Maybe you didn't come into this place with palm branches. But you have your hands. You have a voice. You have a heart. You have a body. That you as well could honor the king for who he is. And today I feel as though it's a great day to start off the week giving honor to our king. Giving honor to our God. Giving honor to our Lord. Giving honor to our Savior. Giving honor to our creator. Giving honor to the one who paid a price we could not pay. Who took on the penalty of sin. Took it on the cross. That we could be forgiven, restored, set free. And live a life of victory. That we could look death in the face and say, death, where is your sting? That we could know even in death we win. We're victorious because Jesus was victorious. And this morning I really feel led to open up the altar today and invite you to the front that you could honor God right now and worship him with song and worship him with your voice. Lift up your hands and just have a